This is the clock from John's VW bus. It no longer operates. We're going to find out why it's not working and repair it. John had already replaced these two capacitors, but uh, to determine if there was a catastrophic failure in the clock, I just want to inspect these and take some quick measurements of these old electrolytic capacitors. These are 100 microfarads rated at 16 volts. Let's have a look. I'm dialing in the first capacitor here, and as far as the readings go, it looks pretty precise. We're looking at uh, 104 microfarads with a uh, dissipation factor of, looks about uh, 0.052 around there. So that doesn't look terribly off as far as that reading goes. Obviously, we haven't done the leak down. We'll look at the other capacitor and see what that's reading as far as the value. I've got the other capacitor on now. I'm trying to get that one set up, find out where it's peaking. It looks to be slightly off from from this one, though not far. We're gonna find it's gonna sit around uh, 103 microfarads. Yeah, it looks to be it. 103 it is. So, actually, 102 and a half, we'll say 103 microfarads. Dissipation factor sits at around uh, 0.6. So again, the capacitor is showing good. We'll see what it does in the leak down tester. We're going to set this up for electrolytic. It's rated to 16 volts. We're going to start at 3 and work our way up, and we're going to do a standard leak down test. So set it for discharge, and here we go. We go at 3 volts, 6, 10, and that's 15. So 15 looked okay on this one. I didn't see any problem with this capacitor on electrolytic. We'll take a look at um, mini-lytic, which has a um, more stricter amount of uh, microamps to make the uh, eye open. So let's go to leakage. You can see it's much slower. This is more basic curiosity than anything. So for mini-lytic, it opened at three. I'm sure if it opens at six, it'll take quite a bit longer, but for electrolytic, it passed. Clearly there's nothing, you know, wrong with this um, capacitor. After about five minutes uh, rebuilding on leakage at 15 volts, this mini-lytic setting right here, I opened up fully. So this capacitor is good on its mini-lytic setting. Uh, rated at 15 volts. I, mean, I don't have a setting for 16, but this is sufficient. So this capacitor by all accounts is absolutely fine. It just needed a, a couple of minutes with some current going through it to rebuild. It's going to start the next one on Mini-Lytic and we're starting it at 3 volts and we can see that the um, capacitor is showing a short. This one's going to have to rebuild just like the last one did. And when 3 volts finishes, I'll move it to 6 volts. And when 6 volt finishes, I'll move it all the way up to 15 at that point and just let it sit there. And there's 3 volts. Open up. Switch to 6 volts. And then repeat the same process. And here we have 6 volts opening up now. Once this opens, move to 15. And here's 15 opening up now. Is it possible that these capacitors work fine, but they had excessive leakage, you know, when power was applied to the clock? Yes. Are they rebuilt and, and working now? Yes. So we'll see how they were applied in the circuit to find out what happened. I think this concludes way too much attention given to two small electrolytic capacitors. So we'll end this now. And that's it. To remove the clock from the outer case, there are three flathead screws and this one uh, soldered tail that I believe connects the uh, clock to actual ground, which this uh, galvanized chassis is, so that needs to be unsoldered. I removed the three screws and unsoldered that little pin, and the whole clock fell right through the chassis onto the table. Let's lift it up and have a look. And there it is. Set up a DC power supply for 
12 volts and limited it to like 20 milliamps of current. I thought that would be uh, safe to plug into this clock. 20 milliamps is about as low as I can go setting this thing up right now. So we'll give it a shot. So I decided to remove that foam to have a good look at the board so I can get these connectors on here. And, and it looks like when somebody had previously tried to take this apart, they did not know about this soldered portion to ground. And it was a pretty violent event uh, to get this thing off of here. And it broke off the uh, phenolic material of the board as well as some traces. I think this would be a good time to investigate to see if that damage uh, could be causing any issues before I proceed further. That would be the prudent thing to do. I'm going to stop here and take a look. Um, I, will, I will point out, though, that uh, uh, I've connected power to it and, and ramped up power slowly. The, the, the clock is not working, but this, this can't be good. Uh, none of those traces seem to be broken. I'm going to have to remove this circuit board from the clock itself. There are some mounting points that uh, made the clock to the circuit board that are also uh, structurally holding the circuit board into place. I'm going to take them off now with the solder sucker. We have uh, three posts here. We have, um, th these two are the coil. Uh, the other side of these posts actually connect to this coil inside. This post here was the one with, that connected to the broken piece of circuit board. And this is uh, common ground. And right here, this was not connected to the circuit board. This is sort of floating between plastic. And this was the 12 volt input. So we can inspect these things now. Now that we've taken the circuit board out of the equation, make sure this piece is okay. And the coil could be checked with continuity tester and a, uh, um, get a reading of, of how many ohms that is and that'll check that and then we could investigate these two other parts the coil was good on continuity and read 290 ohms i should point out there was a fourth pin here i neglected to mention uh this fourth pin carries that 12 volts back up to the circuit board that was missed uh this uh center one the third one here that was structural where all the grounds connected to it doesn't go to anything down here again it is structural and was a it was a central tie-off for the grounds I've removed the broken piece of circuit board. Now that I've removed all that extra solder, the first order of business is to repair this piece of phenolic material, and then I will redo the broken jumpers. Then I'll start testing. Super glue, I'll wait for it to dry, and then I'll re-solder the bridges. The assumption is that everything else on this board is associated circuitry. Uh, imagine, given the size of these capacitors, there's some filtration here, uh, and a resistor, and obviously, for the purpose of timing, there's a, uh, a crystal oscillator, 800, what does it say, 812 kilohertz? I can, I can hardly read that. It's at 812 kilohertz. Either way, though, super glue is, has dried. You, you could barely even see this circuit board is cracked. And this stuff is really porous. If you glue it just right, use just the right amount of super glue, not too much. Once this stuff dries, I mean... It's a nice, it's a nice repair. I'm gonna re-solder those bridges and we'll continue on. I've gone over all the traces. It's a, it's a little robust, but there wasn't a whole lot to work with, so I had to make my own traces out of lead. Uh, either way, it's all been reattached. Everything is good now. So now we'll be able to hook some power up, hook it up to your oscilloscope, and see what we got. So I went and checked about this particular IC, the SEL 5419AE, and it's like from the black hole of IC chips. There's absolutely nothing online about it with regard to a data sheet. Now, people do talk about it. There's a Dutch website that discusses people trying to repair clocks and trying to find information on them. And there's no information available about these chips. So, while I found websites where you can get them, you can actually buy them, I'm going to have to trace it out and try and find what the inputs and outputs are in this and see if we're getting thing from this chip. If all the other components are working and this is not, maybe we could try a shotgun replacement if we could get our hands on one. Let's see what we got. We have coil, coil, ground, and over here is 12 volts. So we'll get those connections done and we'll see what we got. We can see that the 12 volts uh, immediately goes through this resistor, making this a, uh, a voltage dropping resistor. We'll find out what that voltage t does. It comes down and goes into one of the pins on this IC. The pin is on the top left, and that's going to be um, the last pin on the IC. So pin 14 is where the voltage comes in. 
voltage at the voltage dropping resistor and subsequently at pin 14 is 10.6 volts when the input voltage is 12. I'm seeing roughly all the same voltages coming out of these seven pins which is uh, not a terribly good sign. So it looks like given the fact that the resistor is working there's no coil connected which I'll also admit uh, a dummy load might help here but given the fact that the uh, resistor is working, the capacitors are working, the voltage I know to be correct it's coming from an external source. Uh, the only thing here is the IC which seems to be the failure. John has been doing some research of his own and found a functionally identical IC called the SAJ300R CMOS and this IC is a drop-in replacement exact same thing that's in um, this clock except that this one is obtainable and he was able to provide me with this data sheet not only describes the theory of operation and function but a schematic telling me what the uh, outputs are and the expected circuitry that would be employed for a chip of this design so we're going to order up an SAJ300R and pop it in here and we're going to see what happens